I'm Mark Sankter. And I'm Linda Zayas Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to Arcane Mark Dev Tools Outlining an Adventure. So this is uh, not just about outlining a professional adventure, although that's the only time that you absolutely have to outline it or you don't know what you're going to get from the freelancer. It's also an episode that's about outlining adventures in case you want to outline an adventure for your own adventure. And you don't need to send it over to a freelancer because you're the freelancer of your own heart. So, Aww. so um, Linda, yes. you have outlined a lot more adventures than I have due to the fact that you work on adventures and I don't. So we're going to be relying on your outlining skills because I usually don't outline my adventures. Mm -hmm. But you guys can, and most people do. So, um, Linda, what would you say is the most important thing to remember when outlining an adventure? The most important thing to remember when outlining an adventure to give um, is to, I'm talking about professionally when you're giving it to someone else, is to give them enough guidance that you know what you're going to get overall, but to give them enough flexibility that they can exercise their own creativity and surprise you with their ideas. Okay, and oh, thanks, Pobo Crusader, for the, whoa, lots of one cheers <laughs> and, the, uh, and the 400 cheers, too. Thank you. Especially the 400, but there is, that is a lot of one. <laughs> It's like the Twitch equivalent of like, um, I guess like flicking pennies at, at someone. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so more shi it's so much more shiny and pretty. Oh, that's right. He has to get rid of the other ninety-five when he lost the five. All right. So you're saying that you need to not over outline when you're giving it to someone else because you want you need to outline the right amount because yes. you need to make sure that you d they don't come back with something that is like horrifically inappropriate for what you need, but also that they can use their creativity. Yeah, and um, so this is very much talking from my perspective as a as, so, as someone at Paizo, where um, in order to make sure that the storylines fit with the overall canon and that everyone is properly communicating about things, um, we run all of our outlines by James Jacobs, and then he approves those. So then we know that the story is something that... Um, the story is something that's part of the overall arc of what's happening at Paizo. It's not going to contradict anything or cause any issues. So we know enough to know that the fundamentals are solid and that everyone's on the same page for those. And uh, in particular, if you have a scenario that is part of a story arc or um, a scenario that you need to fulfill a particular purpose, then, um, then that's when we would be giving more guidance, uh, more guidance on that. And um, also when outlining scenarios, uh, that's, that's one aspect we consider. And another one is the level of experience of the person that we are assigning it to. So um, if we're assigning a scenario to a brand new person, then we're going to give a lot more guidance and extra helpful tips and notes and things like that than we would if we're assigning to a more experienced person. And um, the other factor that goes into that soup is just kind of how inspired we feel when we're outlining the adventure. Um, so if you are looking at an adventure and you're thinking, oh, well, I have a general idea about this, but I don't really have a specific vision, then, uh, then for those, we'll put in something that is more open-ended and we'll just put in a little bit of structure for the freelancer. But if we're looking at something and we're thinking, ooh, I definitely want an adventure that's like this, then um, you'll get more guidance there. So if you're someone who regularly uh, freelances for us, then you might notice a difference in outlines and that sort of where that isn't just the uh, the decrease in detail. And that's sort of where that comes from. Uh -huh. uh, now that asked, my understanding from talking with freelancers is they receive a brief outline and then submit a more detailed outline. What do you look for in their submissions? Great question, Numbat. So um, what we look for in the submissions is that the freelancer has filled in the major story beats and details that we left unfinished in the starting outline. So if the starting outline says that the, the PCs meet up with a friendly 
existing merchants in this location, we'd be looking for them to, or the PC meet up with some person in this location, we'd be looking for them to say, okay, what kind of person is this? Um, giving a little more, uh, filling in filling in those major building blocks that aren't there, and also giving us a sense of what all the encounters are and what the beats are of the story. So, um, so we might say that, you know, the, and the PCs fight something, it could, it's a good fits for this section would be plant or animal monster. Um, so there's actually a lot of leeway and the freelancer can put the personality on it. So like yeah. if you were like, the PCs meet someone and they're friendly and they help, and just yeah. to use two examples of freelancers who are currently in the chat, mm -hmm. and then you had decided to say either Kate or Alex, and Kate was like, well, it's actually like a merfolk um, who takes you underwater or something like that, and Alex is like, the Kitsune who is secretly uh, infiltrating the area. Yeah. Then either of those could work in the adventure if you didn't specify no Kitsune or no mm -hmm. Murpho. I will not deny you your one Kitsune, Alex. <laughs> yes, this actually happened. That was where an actual quote from uh, Linda to Actual Alex. quote because uh, I had an open-ended session with some NPCs and he put a Kitsune in there and he's like, is that okay? And I'm like, I will not deny you your one Kitsune, Alex. I'm not a monster. <laughs> do you tend to stay to level range or leave that to the next person along to work, work out? Um, we do stay at the level range, um, which in Pathfinder Society is the both the, the tier, um, which is the overall range of all players all right, that can play it, help. and the sub tiers, which are the um, the band the sort of sub bands of that that we um, design the adventures for. So, for example, they would have a tier one to four scenario with sub tiers one, two, and three, four. So you would, one two would be written um, generally to expect level one and two characters, and three four would be written generally to expect um, level uh, three and four characters. Um, and not only do we state the level range in the outline, the level range of um, all scenarios across the entire season is at least given a um, at least given a proto outline, which we usually stick to with a few changes maybe along the way. Um, farther back, are you making fun of my dresses? No. Yes, maybe. <laughs> Mark. I was just mimicking them to remind people that they could be any of those situations. <laughs> All right. So, um, so, 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 um, yeah, we, we set out the outline early on, and, um, and that's generally what we stick to. And, um, and that is, um, how, that, that's basically to make sure that there is, oh, damn it, hold my hands behind my back if that's what you want. Um, that's generally to make sure that, why do I even with you? <laughs> now, now I can't, like, look at this and have you, like, making fun of me and still, like, concentrate and focus and not be laughing at you. <laughs> Don't give me that look. All right, so um, so where was it? Oh yeah, so we generally plan that out from the beginning, and uh, that way we make sure that there's a good distribution of um, tiers and for the adventure. So we make sure that um, also we look at the locations for each adventure. Um, for early on, we'll have that on the outline so that we know okay, this is this uh, these adventures are in these countries. So you know we're probably going to want to. Um, we're probably going to want to shake things up a little bit and make sure that we have a, a good map of areas. Another thing that we will plot out, at least up in a proto way from the beginning, is um, the faction tie-ins for scenarios to make sure that those are well distributed. So that's the, those those things uh, we definitely know um, from the, from earlier on, even before the outline stage. So those are definitely fixed. So what are your faction tie-ins and what's your what's your level are the basically the first things that we know about an adventure. Oh, and uh, thanks for the bits, GM Reckless, and also Nitrace going back. I did not notice that PJ Salt was a was a bit, but it is. So thank, thank you, you guys very much. both. That was quite a good amount, especially from Nitrace. So um, I got super squirreled in the in the mind from all the things that were just yeah, going on there. Yeah, but you were there. talking about the. Um, fact that you put in fact and connections and other things like that um, into your outline. So what would you say other than the fact that the required faction connections are the most important points 
to make sure that are covered when you write the outline. Mm-hmm. Before I take that, um, false one asks, is the statement proof is used for APs? Yes, APs have the level band that's assigned to the authors in advance, as well as a overall broad outline, although um, APs tend to be a little more open-ended in their outlines than, um, than scenarios, in part just because they're so long that um, if you were too specific at that point, then things may may cause more issues. I've heard that the style also depends on, like, who's outlining the AP and what the situation is for the AP. Because I've certainly heard of some APs having very, very tight outlines where almost everything that are major beats are decided, and others that are just very, like, just make this work here are the main Well, Age of Ashes was component. particularly strange because since we were all internal freelancers, it was mostly just determined in some meetings what we would do, and then we wrote up our own proto-outlines, and then James was like, looks good, and then we wrote the adventure. Seems legit. Um, yeah, so what was your, your actual question? But I did want to get false ones first. So you were asking what are the most important... What are the most important things to make sure that you cover in an outline that's going to someone else in the next stage? Yeah, okay, so, um... Where where does the event where does the adventure begin? Um, giving a sense of how the PCs might get to the location that they're going to. Uh, what are the what is the main objective that the PCs are trying to secure here? Um, what are the types of things that they encounter? Is this a adventure that's going to be? Uh, when, and when you have things that are big, you want to be big story beats that are not combat. So if you want a chase, if you want a social interaction scene, if you want things like that, uh, putting those those structures in there. Um, also, if there are tie-ins to any other adventures, um, one of the things that we put in outlines is a list of references, and um, then we also grant those references as PDFs to the authors. So the references will include anything from um, the world guide is the inner sea world guide is a very common one to give. Also, um, campaign settings, um, adventure paths, anything that really in a substantial, a substantial and different from other sources and useful way touches on um, what's going on in your adventure. So this is definitely going to be past scenarios as well. That not just ones that um, not just ones that have the thematic connections um, in terms of what the elements of the plot are but also ones that we think really are standout in terms of how they handle certain structures. So for example, if we have a, a chase, that, an inverted chase where PCs are running away from something, then we're likely to give, uh, we're likely to give uh, one of the past scenarios that had an inverted chase in it. Um, so we, we look at those, or if we have a scenario that has a heavy social aspect, um, we're likely to look at how how that works so um yeah so it's giving them some guidance also for um for maps and now i'm now i'm going backwards through the outline at this stage um we know that um there's some allowance for custom maps which is uh one full page or two half page maps so full page map being about 24 squares by 30 squares and half page maps being roughly 20 by 20 around there um so we know there's some allowance for that but there's also going to need to be maps that are not um, that are not custom, and so for that um, we generally look through and will all of the Paizo uh, maps that are still in print. Still in print is important because we need to let GMs buy their stuff. Um, that are still in print, and we'll give a list of suggestions of maps that we think uh, would fit well for that. Um, right. I think another thing I didn't mention was uh, was any key NPCs that you want to uh, to have appear in the scenario. So we'll before you do, them. I yes. want to thank um, Night Trace for gifting five tier one subs. Oh, wow. Um, to Yay, the community. Night Trace. Thank you. All right. So we've got to, um, once we get some of this other Streamlabs stuff worked out, or maybe before we do, on for Tuesday's episode, we should have that, um, that reward where it, um, Whenever anyone buys it, we make Night Trace a level 2 CFS character. I agree. All right. So, uh, continue. All right. 
So I was saying another thing in that um, starting question was um, making sure that you have the important NPCs covered. So you've got the important NPCs, the story beats, where you begin, where you end, where the scenario is set. Um, also, sometimes, um, sometimes the source of inspiration for the story will be something different than one of those things that may be, for example, a monster. So, um, or it may be even a specific request from another team of something that they want to have happen. Um, for example, Reaver's Roar came about because um, for the Tyrant's Craft Adventure Path, there was a particular location with a particular monster in it, and the Adventure Path team came to us and were like, it would be really nice if this monster wasn't here. And we're like, got this. So that's, we have a, a scenario that came about, and then in that scenario we knew this creature that is in this location at the beginning of the scenario needs to not be in this location at the end of the scenario. So that makes sense. Um, what would you say would be most important for someone to sort of take out of these lessons if they were just going to be outlining the adventure for themselves? and not for a different freelancer. Yeah, so if you're just outlining an adventure for yourself, I mean, you obviously then don't need to tell, there, there, there's sort of equivalence of these. So while you don't need to tell another person what good sources are to read, um, if you have other sources, say you're writing an adventure in Galerion and you want to, you want to draw upon the lore that is already out there, doing some of your own research through your sources um, is, is a good thing to do there. Um, deciding, um, you don't really need to pre-decide maps, um, for if you're doing, um, an adventure and you're just outlining it for yourself. Um, although maybe you have some existing flip maps and map packs and other published map products that you want to use in the adventure, so you can certainly use those as a source of inspiration if you want to be able to pull out the cool map that you already have or the one you've got pre-drawn or something like that. Um, in terms of the adventure itself, yeah, definitely knowing uh, knowing where you want to start and where you want to end, um, knowing what type of adventure you want it to focus on, whether it is a combat-focused adventure, a social adventure, if it's a social adventure, like is it an intrigue adventure, is it a heist adventure, is it an adventure that is going to make heavy use of skill checks in another way, are you going to have chases, are you going to be using these different systems, and... Um, so no, knowing that general structure, knowing what your, um, knowing what the key beats are along the way, um, what you want the PCs to accomplish along the way, what is a what is a sort of excellent success in the scenario or the adventure, and what is a sort of success enough? Because it's always nice to have and uh, Pathfinder Society and Starfinder Society scenarios and such have this worked in um, in terms of the primary and secondary success system. But it's always nice to have a, you did it, you can count as a success level, and also a level of, oh wow, we did awesome at that, built into your adventure structure. So that may be, um, that may be, did you defeat the villain and stop them from escaping in, in your in your own in your own adventures? Did you um, did you uncover this particular cache of information? Did you? take care of, um, did you take care of a lot of information, or did you take care of this other situation? Did you rescue these people in time? Those kinds of things can really be um, interesting, interesting points. Um, and also, if you, um, when you're outlining an adventure for yourself, uh, coming up with, if there's points where you expect there to be a, a branch where the PCs could go one way or the other, um, we are have to be a little more constrained in published adventures with how we handle branches because if it's equally likely that the PCs are going to go over here and do thing A that takes the rest of the adventure or thing B that takes the rest of the adventure, we're still going to need to overlap, use the same components, things like that. But you can totally outline an adventure where there are branches um, and you PCs could go one way or another and then so knowing what to do in either case. So um, I want didn't want to interrupt you in the middle of that monologue, but... I actually missed something, so 
GM Reckless gifted five subs. It was one reason why I seem, may have seemed a little confused when I thanked Nitra. So, but GM Reckless gifted five subs, and I thought it was GM Reckless. But when I went back to the chat, I saw that it was actually Nitra. But actually, they both gifted five subs. Oh, five wow. Subs, Thanks, guys. Like one after Thank the you. other, and I had missed. Um, that that occurred. That's so, why it said very nice of you too. Okay, that makes so sense. So Jim Reckless, thank you, thank you as well. We did also, not mean to. We did not mean to overlook you. Yes, we absolutely didn't. In fact, you were the one I went on to think, but by then it looked like in the chat that it, it was Nitrace. Uh, I did not scroll up. So thank you both, and I did. Um, I did put the uh, we make Nitrace level two character into the. Um, into the rewards because Nitrate asked for some kind of reward to get a level two character for his playtest points. So we will see how many level two characters Nitrate winds up with. It could be a lot. It could be a little. Um, so sorry, Linda. I did put up my hand and may may have stopped you to to say that. But did you have any more on that topic, or should we move to some of the um, questions? We can move on. We can move on to some of the questions. I mean, you're asking me extremely open-ended questions here, yes. so that, that's uh, perfect fodder for getting me to monologue until well, you sure. ask me something else. So, um, Spartan is wondering for custom one shots for Pathfinder: Is there a chart or way to determine combat and how many creatures to use? So, um, in Pathfinder Society, and I believe in Starfinder Society as well, there's the concept of major encounters and minor encounters, um, where a major encounter in, in first edition, now we are going to need to update our assumptions a bit coming into second edition, because encounters tend to be more efficient in second edition than they are in first. Um, but in, in first edition, we say that a major encounter is something that you would expect to take up to an hour. And a minor encounter is something that we would expect to take up to 20 to 30 minutes. So, um, so we'll look at for each um, for each tier of adventure, um, we have guidelines in that were in our writer's guide for how many major encounters and how many minor encounters we should have. So, um, so the minor, so the lower level you are, the more encounters that you have generally that are slated for the adventure, just because we know high level combats take longer, so we just say fewer encounters overall. Another type of guideline that we have in there is a guideline for the difficulty of encounters. So um, again, this is I'm talking about first. I'm talking about first edition here. Um, in first edition, we'll have a thing that says in a say tier one to five scenario, then the hardest encounter that you should not have encounters that are you should not have hard or epic encounters ever. Um, Whereas in a tier 12 to 15 scenario, um, you should have an epic encounter in most cases. Or you, if you don't, then you should have multiple hard encounters that come together in some kind of an interesting way. So we, uh, so we also offer those additional guidelines in terms of how to both look at the number of encounters and how challenging they are. Um, in in second edition, we're looking more at the the system as it is in terms of sort of the the different the difficulties of encounters. So you know you have your you have your moderate encounters. You have so regardless, we want to be careful with severe encounters because those are in extreme encounters. Um, we have not yet presented an extreme encounter, and I don't know if we would outside of very I, unusual I circumstances. It for organized play. I, I'm I'm thinking that might be like maybe possible for a hard mode oh, down yeah. the line that or something. That seems like it's a hard mode. Yeah, but um, severe would be our cap. Um, the scaling system between uh, between the, the more fine-tuning of the scaling in um, second edition as an RPG and also some of the greater fine-tuning that we're doing in the um, scaling for the number and power of players that you'll see in the guide that's coming out soon means that we can really just go with what this what the second edition suggests and I think that in your case, if you're running a home game, then you're going to expect that all players are going to be the same level. And you can really just use the guidelines that are provided in the core rule book. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the org play scaling, shout out to John Compton. He and I worked together to figure out pretty much every permutation and make sure that adding more players to your table does not make you fight weaker monsters and losing players from your table does not suddenly make you fight stronger opponents. So um, that should hopefully work out better than the weird stuff that happens sometimes in the corner cases in first edition. 
So, um, Linda, the next question is, how do specialized subsystems come about, such as the Hell's Rebels Rebellion system? Um, so there's a few ways I could answer this question. In, um, generally, the subsystems in um, Adventure Paths are written by are written by freelancers and then they are developed in and then in first edition at least and then they're developed in house. I think they're usually in the outline where yeah. it's like we want a rebellion system occasionally and um, this is sometimes taken more like design path style that designers are on mm -hmm. but occasionally a adventure will just come in from the freelancer with like three subsystems that you didn't order mm -hmm. um, that are really cool. And then it's like, well, uh, designer, make sure these work because they're cool and we didn't order this. Mm -hmm. But usually you would say, hey, we want some kind of s tracking system that is sort of a victory point system that tracks how Rebellion works. And then a freelancer would provide them. And in first edition, um, there wasn't a designer assigned to the adventure. So um, it would sort of just rely on getting a really good freelancer to um, to come up with a system that worked for the adventure path. So I've written two um, I've written two subsystems at least um, before. Um, so I and I've gotten different amounts of guidance on them. So I did get an outline for one that was not necessary. I got an out more thorough outline for, for example, the persona system that's in the back of War for the Crowns. Um, and so for that, it was a multi-page outline that sort of specified what kinds of features. Uh, what kind of features this system should have and that they would have these general these general ideas But it was also there's also still always this back and forth um, If you have ideas as a freelancer, then you can always suggest them to your developer and say like hey I have this idea. Could I do something this way? So you don't want to uh, You don't want to read what's what's in the outline say I have a better idea and just do it and send that to your developer or your because then then you're not doing what they asked for, and that could cause issues. Um, and this is the same thing with any outline, whether it's an adventure or not. Um, but you're always welcome to to pose ideas and suggestions, and oftentimes we can go with those, and those work well. And it's great to be it's great to be involved in dynamic and have that conversation. All right, that makes sense. So the next question is from Ruximus. What tips do you have for structuring a zero level game? To find out what game nuances the players will like. Is this about a session zero? We had a whole it could episode, be, but I think it that. might be about zero level, like playing when the characters were just blacksmiths and like doing a prequel. It's 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 one or the other. So well, if it's about session zero, we had a, a episode that talked about that in detail. And you can check that one out. It's sort of like, um, what was it? GM Tools New Beginnings. New Beginnings. GM Tools New Beginnings is the name and should be on YouTube. If it is in fact about playing zero level characters, well, you'd want variant rules to play zero level characters, which um, if it's going to, if it would be out anytime soon, that would be in the book like the Game Master Guide rather than the Core Rule Book. And um, then at that point, you just sort of, want to tell sort of a more low-key story that can fit the zero level characters sometimes playing with zero level characters doesn't really show you what part of the new game's nuances that the players will actually like because well they're just like a blacksmith and an acolyte and a wizard's apprentice at that point in time so they don't really have the same heft and the blacksmith may not enjoy combat as much as like the fighter when they're actually a fighter is going to enjoy combat because they might not enjoy being frail so i actually don't think that zero level games are necessarily a good way to find out what game nuances the players like but it could be a good way to like tell a prequel of the story when the characters were much younger so i, I feel like it's more useful narratively than it is um, mechanically to run a zero level game. And if it's talking about session zero, then check out GM Tools New Beginnings. All right, um, so what have we got here? I think we've made it through all of the currently pressing questions mm -hmm. um, about outlining. So, would you care to ask me something open ended that's basically yeah. please tell me a, please tell me about a decent fraction of your job in a monologue? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, We've, you've talked about like best practices, but 
Can you give any examples of sort of when an outline was not sufficient? And this isn't like throw a freelancer on the bus because their thing wasn't sufficient. I mean, when you outlined something and you realized later that the outline needed something else that you didn't include so that we can give an example to the viewers um, from both directions of not only how to make a good outline, but what made an outline that seemed like it was good at the time uh, miss a step. Well, I find that um, the biggest time this happens is actually when I'm working with a very experienced freelancer and I, I say like, and I leave a very large, oh, you figure it out gap in there. And then um, when it comes, and then it comes back and it's something along these lines and I'm very vague. And then when it comes back, it's something that went in such a different direction from what I was thinking that I need to rethink some fundamentals about the adventure. So in that case, I would either, um, I, I would either reorient my thinking on the adventure because that idea is awesome and I want to go with it, or I would talk to them and be like, oh, actually, this isn't going to quite work because of X, Y, and Z. Should have given you more guidance on that. How about something like variation of what you had initially suggested? So yeah, I find that, that the biggest the biggest time when things, uh, when things get a little more complicated, um, this happened a little bit with, um, th this happened a little bit with um, the Half-Life Path scenario with uh, Brian Duckwitz because... I basically was just like, uh, come up with stuff. Caramaga. Caramaga. Stuff. stuff. And then, um, and he came up with some great stuff, but as it so happened, some uh, because I hadn't said, oh, and don't touch this thing, one of the things that he came up with... Wasn't it, like, almost exactly the same as Isabel's adventure that he didn't know about? It was, yeah. It, it, it was with, with Ralderos? Yeah. One of, one of the things that he, some of the things he came up with overlapped with other things and I just hadn't accounted for that possibility. So like he had great ideas, it's just for other reasons that wouldn't work. So that I'd say is Right, because you can't it's hard to say like do anything you want except this other thing that you might do that is exact is like basically the same as another scenario. Yeah. So, so that's the biggest the biggest issue that I have is um because I guess I, I'll never know when by over specifying something I stifled creativity and didn't get something awesome. So it's only obvious. So I, I want to be very wary of that because there's no real way to tell for it. But when I go in the other direction, then that's when it, uh, that's when it can sometimes come back and cause problems. Or um, for maps, uh, and then there were, there were some other things that were just in the outline that we didn't initially specify that we then became more clear about. Like, okay, don't pick any maps that are out of print. Here, here's some more suggestions for maps. Some of the ways that we do things in outlines is to fix issues in the past. Where, for example, we would get over uh, turnover, we get over um, milestones because you don't have to specify your maps at the at the outline phase. We get over milestones or even final turnovers because they hadn't specified the maps yet. And these encounters are completely written to use a map that's out of print. And we can't use that. So then, at that point, it's too late to order art for a new map, and uh, so we have to use an existing map. And we have to find the one that works. And we had particularly had problems with this for a while before the classics line came out with ship maps, because so many of the ship maps were out of print, except for the one that had like the giant warships and things like that. And so we're like, oh gosh, like do we use something that's out of print? And I think in that there was at least one case where we have chosen to use something that's out of print, but will be reprinted in a month because it's so much more fitting for the circumstance and just be like, sorry to the GMs who are running this immediately when it comes out, <laughs> but we can either have one month where this map is more difficult for you to access, or we can have forever that this scenario doesn't have a good map for it and we have to shoehorn in something else. False one says that you're giving art commissioning flashbacks. Um, Craigity has a question, which is, have you ever ran a game where you only knew what monsters were involved and the general idea of the location, or do you always use pre-made adventures? So do you want to take this one first? Because I've been talking a lot? I can. I feel like your answer is mostly easier than mine. Okay, but, fine. I will I will uh, answer first. So, um, I've always run... Um, I haven't run an adventure that is completely and 100% homebrew, but I've certainly run adventure paths that have a lot of homebrew content. Um, and that, so, um, I mean, for, for Keymaker, we had almost a year of play that wasn't actually touching 
any of the books. You had a hex map that was as large as the largest ones that were in any volume that was just entirely an area that you made up. Yeah, so we had a lot of, um, so I have a lot of sections that are added. Um, and for those, yes, I will generally know which monsters are involved and a general idea of the location and a general idea of what treasure the PCs are going to find. Um, and because our home group generally does theater of the mind, and I don't, that means I don't need maps, which makes things a lot easier. Um, and sometimes I may not even know what they're going to encounter particularly. I may just have a vague sense of what's in that area, and, um, and then I'll be relying on things more like the NPC codex and the villain codex if they do something that I don't expect. So I might know that they're, I might know, okay, they're going to this country, uh, they're going over to Maivon, they're going to do these kinds of things. Here are the main NPCs they're going to interact with, and they're probably going to do a duel, so let me have, like, a couple of duelist stat blocks that I picked out, I've written or picked out of the NPC codex, but, like, if they decide to do something else in that, while they're in that country, I don't know what they're going to do, so I just need to be ready. That makes sense. Huh. Bob Ross is back at the suggestion again. I think maybe it's the design tag that, that caused that to happen. I don't know. Um... So maybe it's just when like I talk in a calm and soothing voice. No, I think Bob it's Ross that appears. we have the design tag, and that's both for designing games, but also like art, art design, probably. Um, I don't mind Bob Ross being a suggestion, not in the least. All right. No, it was funny because we talked about it earlier when we <laughs> let, we just need to chill and not um, cause <laughs> the camera to pop. So um, I'll also answer Craig D's question. I have definitely run a lot of my own content that's pretty much entirely what i ran until um we just had lots of votes for our group and at one point in time the group split so i just ran two adventures one of which was homebrew and the other of which was rise of the rune lords and then after that um i got an adventure pass subscription for linda um so that she could get started gming with town 12 thieves which was the one that was coming out at that time so this dates back when that around when that happened mm -hmm. And starting from then, there were enough Paizo Adventure Paths that people wanted me to run that we just even had more Adventure Paths than we could run. And I haven't really done too many homebrew um, settings or games except for mostly with Linda because um, we don't always want to burn an Adventure Path when it's just the two of us. Although we have run several one-on-one -on -one Adventure Paths. We have, but we don't always want to. Yeah. Um, so we've done some, um, we've done some more recent sort of, um, homebrew adventures, and typically when I do those, um, I wouldn't say it's always what monsters are involved in the general idea of a location, but it's, but it's more like what NPC, what characters are involved, some of whom are monsters, and the general idea of the situation, because, um, they tend not to be all focused on one big dungeon even though there definitely are dungeons and a lot of encounters in them sometimes the biggest dungeon for linda to map could just be a like a three by three grid that all has guards and wards um this is a uh this is a reference to my first encounter with the guards and ward spell um i didn't know that it was a thing and so i thought we were in a super convoluted area and i was trying to map it and i have i still have the piece of paper where I had this giant map of the dungeon that I was trying to make, and I had found what I thought were patterns, but were just, you know, little coincidences it in the noise like of data. It was like 20 feet by 20 feet with, um, if you imagine a 3x3 a three three grid where every 10 feet it turns, so there are, like, sort of nine total places you can be other than corridor. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. Yeah. But um, not only was I playing a very stubborn character, but I thought that Mark was posing a fascinating puzzle. And I was determined to solve it. But it was just randomly sending her. just and like no, one, no, none of the more experienced players at the table decided to disabuse me of that notion. But we all had a good laugh afterwards. Yep. Um, this was like, yeah, this was only, a, this was like in my first few months of playing my first tabletop RPG, so. Mm-hmm. Um, so, let's see, there is another question. Um, Ruximus is modifying a pop culture movie, Aliens, into a Lovecraftian bug hunt. Any suggestions? And, do, um, and then the follow-up is, do you homebrew pop culture ideas? So, 
what do you think? So, aliens, so it's all about, like, things that go inside of you and then, like, eat out, eat you out from the inside. I mean, that's certainly, that's certainly works well for the Lovecraftian theme. I would say when you're, uh, when you're drawing inspiration from pop culture for your own adventure, now I'm not talking about, uh, I'm assuming this is for your home group and not for published adventures. Published adventures, you have to be a lot more careful and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if it's for your home group, I would say that um, look at the source material as an inspiration and not as a straitjacket, um, because because oftentimes you'll find that say say like that you were thinking, okay, well, what kind of monsters are going to work best for this story? What what am I what am I going to use for the chestburster or whatever? Um, you might come up with custom monsters for that, or you may also find monsters or things that are in the monsters that work well from best series and things like that, and then those monsters may have their own ecology and things that can come up with inspiration. For instance, you could use the Hive from um, Horror Adventures. They're so totally different than the aliens from Aliens that um, they, they can have their own ecology that you can use for inspiration. Are they very similar to the aliens from Aliens and totally based on that? Perhaps. Okay. Well, well there's, <laughs> a, there's a good... Uh, there, there's a good answer to your very specific question there. Well, but, uh, yeah. if it's in first edition, if it's anyway. In first edition. But really, I agree with Linda. You, you, sometimes if you delve too deep, if you stare too deep into um, the source material, especially if it's Lovecraft, then maybe appropriately for Lovecraft, where looking at books too deeply could cause problems. Generally, I find like the deeper I look into Lovecraft, the more that I see thinly veiled racism, so I tend to try to use it as inspiration rather than being more direct. Um, in terms of pop culture ideas, I definitely have used them before, especially in joking adventures, like when I was running um, a Starfinder uh, playtest during the closed Starfinder playtest, I, I ran Ryza of the, of the Space Lords, which was just Rise of the Rune Lords in space, but we had all sorts of... Um, weird random references like Grobar the Hutt mm -hmm. was this um, instead of Mayor Grobar is from Magnamar on Magmar 5 the mm -hmm. lava and monuments planet um, the the president of Magmar 5 was, was named Grobar, Grobar the, the Hutt. Hutt he was this giant orange slug creature that um, wanted to sort of um, block the swarm off from coming towards everybody with like giant space walls everywhere and it was pretty weird mm -hmm. so um there's definitely been pop culture references that that i will use and current, current events silly. current events in that case as well but um uh, also also i'd say certainly in um in jade regent you drew a lot of inspiration from anime tropes in the way that um in the way that certain npcs were portrayed and anime tropes and jrpg tropes that's true because after all it was the going to totally not asia adventure path so mm -hmm. It had to have anime tropes and different um, characters who, who fit into those situations. Um, all right, so let's see. Are we? Oh into... wait, it looks like um, it looks like Owen is here, and he Hi, said, "Hi, welcome." Yeah, welcome, Owen. He said a lot of pop culture ideas are inspiration for things that make it into Paizo books. So it's good training on being inspired by something rather than duplicating it. That's a super good point, because if you just duplicate it, it's just generally not as interesting as when you make it up yourself. And let's read Owen's other comment here. Myself, okay. if I want to be inspired by pop culture, I will often look at what other people have done with that inspiration. Like, look at the movie Species and the Dark Horse Alien comics to see how they ripped off the same pop culture source. All right. There was another one up before before Owen's question, uh, if we like Mega Dungeons. Oh, yeah. I totally missed that. Personally, um, I get bored if there's a lot of combats in a row without variety. So um, there are certain mega dungeons that I think are really interesting. So I think that Shattered Star does an excellent job of having mega dungeons that have lore and story and uh, NPCs that you can interact with in interesting ways. So I enjoy that kind of mega dungeon. But if we're talking about more of a uh, more of a like just attack the thing. Um, it, it really depends on the group and what's going on, too. So, for example, um, I was in a office game that was playing uh, Temple of Elemental Evil, and you don't really get more mega dungeon -y than that. But that was a blast because uh, 
the because of the GM and the players. We had uh, James Jacobs was the GM, and he imbued everything with so much personality and interest. And we also had a lot of great players like Owen in that game. So we had a lot of good in-game banter. So I would say that um, I would say that at its core, I'm generally more interested in adventures that have the opportunity to role play and to be social so if it was just taken to the extreme of and then you go to this room and you fight this monster and then you go to this room and fight this monster no but the way that we've done mega dungeons i do enjoy them how about you uh i was also going to say shattered star is a good example where you can sort of sneak around and um do interesting um heists rather than just constantly fighting everything but first uh, I want to thank um, Elthro for gifting Owen a sub. Um, so now Owen can be a subscription leshy if he comes to the Discord channel in addition to a golem. Um, although, no, not a golem anymore. Uh, that's the question. Should we put someone on a golem if they've worked at Paizo in the past? We don't have any other former employees. I feel employees. like, yes, but subscri would, isn't subscription leshy a subscription higher category leshy is a than, higher tier, than so golem? It will, yeah, it will take you above being a golem because it has secret permissions. Yeah. So we don't have to resolve that just yet, but I think I think Owen deserves to be a golem. I think so. And uh, speaking of Owen, he had a question. Okay. It was up before Elthro's gift. All right. Uh, question: What tools have you tried to use to outline an adventure that turned out not to work well? Hmm. That's an interesting one, Linda. I know that like not every Pathfinder Society adventure um, outline has resulted in a, a success and it's sort of a little different than my question where that where your answer was sort of not specifying one of the weakness mm -hmm. so what were what were things you tried to do in an outline that turned out not to work out okay that were not just oh i didn't give enough information all right um so i would say that the biggest pitfall in that regard is trying to cram too much into one story um because in that case, you can get situations where you ask for all this and then the freelancer writes it all up and it's great and they wrote everything that you wanted, but you realize there's no way that's gonna, you realize partway along the way, either, that they're, either they're going to run out of space or is one thing that may happen, so they don't have enough words for it. Um, the adventure isn't going to fit in the four to five hours that you have, so you're gonna need to cut things anyway. And or, um, Things are certain things are are underspecified because they did keep to the word count, but now there's not enough detail in certain sections. So in that case, you wind up with a situation where not only you, you have to it's you have to cut sections and then you have to write to fill because they didn't have the space to fill things out as much as they needed to, and mm -hmm. then you'll need to reorient the structure in order to um, any, any structural elements that are needed. So if some of those pieces that got cut were carrying weight, then you can run into issues. So, um, this happened with, um, gosh, which Gloom, Gloomspire Adventures, uh, Labyrinth of Hungry Ghosts. Um, so, in that adventure, I asked for too many encounters from Tom Phillips, and he got back with all the encounters that I asked for, and then I realized that this adventure was way too long. Um, and so I ended up cutting one of the encounters, but then beyond that, this, they were so good, and I really loved the story, and I didn't want to cut them. So I had to do something more complicated, where um, where I made encounter I made a lot of encounters easier, going below the guidelines of how difficult encounters would be, just so that um, just so that in that part in that section that was more focused on the story, the PCs would be able to move faster, and I wouldn't have to cut things. And then because of that, then in order to get the combat difficulty, the later encounter. The later encounter got counterbalanced to be more difficult in a way that, uh, in hindsight, with more experience, I realized was was overtuned. So that can create certainly challenges when you ask for too much and then you're trying to figure out how to fix it. All right. Well, that's a that's a good summary. That makes sense to me. So remember, everyone, don't try to pack too much into your outline um, when you're making your own home adventure. I guess you can if, if you're okay with um, the adventure being longer than you expected because you have a lot more control, but especially if it's for organized play, you don't want to do that. Like an adventure path, as in theory, if it can fit into the number of pages of the adventure path, having an adventure path volume that lasts twice as long as other volumes is okay. 
But I, I guess organized play in particular is where that's a, um, a major pitfall. This would also matter if you are specifically trying to wrap something up in a single game session. That's true. Uh, so Night Trace has another question, which is the post Gen Con episode will be a convention recap, right? That's right, Night Trace. <laughs> and our special episode on Tuesday will be sort of a Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Oh my gosh, it's launching episode, because that will be our last episode until all the way after the convention. So it should be a fun special episode that we'll do. And I might talk to um, I might talk to Aaron about seeing how much, if anything, um, he'd like us to to say in terms of spoilers right, right before the game is out. I know a lot of people have their books already. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to do that until we were committed to doing the episode in case he was like, oh, yeah, that'll be great. And then we're like, oh, but we're not doing it. Um, another question, when looking at quests versus scenarios in Pathfinder Society, is a quest serving as a pseudo intro to a future scenario something that would make sense? Um, in terms of like, oh, this is a quest, and then it starts a storyline, and then another scenario later on will um, continue the storyline. I mean, to some extent, what the Helm's Hide quest pack um, sort of helps um, lead into um, passing the torch, uh, yeah. which is a very, very important set of scenarios that have quests that lead in, although that's multiple quests and not just one. Yeah, I would say that that is a, that is a type of structure that could make sense. Um, in the model, if you're talking to, in term, and you could do something like that as a short adventure, as a prequel to a longer adventure in your home game, in terms of what we're looking for in um, Pathfinder Society going forward, though, we're actually going a little bit in the opposite direction with regards to the idea that now quests are self-contained adventures that don't depend upon instead of being packed. But that certainly doesn't mean that we can't set up story elements and quests that we then later pick up in scenarios. All right. Um, and Spartan is wondering when will we see a Piazzo con? Now, I'm sure that the, that is misspelled on purpose because there's like a... Uh, tongue sticking out emoji yeah. afterwards. You will see a Piazzo con at Memorial Day weekend of next year. Uh huh. I was going to say that you would see it on February 30th. Oh, okay. Well, uh, a Piazzo con. What about a Piazzo con? I don't know. What about a Piazzo? What about a Pizza con? There could be. There probably is a Pizza con <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere out there. All right, we are we are squirrels. Um, All right, yeah, I'm gonna put there, a squirrel. Are there any up other there. questions that folks have on outlining adventures? I mean, I've just tried to monologue a bit on my experiences. Yep, my experience is that I don't usually outline adventures. I do something that's very similar to the question that was previously asked by. Um, Craig D, where I figure out what the major players and and what the major sort of bullet points are in um, the adventure, and then I let the PCs stomp around and see what they're going to do. Um, Owen puts out every con as Pizza Con beginning at 9 p.m. So, that is probably true. Because uh, because the other places are closed? I have one last question. How do you handle multiple endings? Um, uh, that's an interesting one from False One. Alright. Um, by trying not to overuse the word if, um, so, uh, to go into what I mean by that, um, I have, in a lot of cases, I'll have a conclusion section that says, if the PCs do, if the PCs, um, uh, if the PCs stopped the evil ritual and also rescued the captives who were going to be sacrificed to the demon lord, then this happens. If they did not, if they stopped the evil ritual and they did not rescue this, then this happens. If they did not stop the evil ritual, then yada, yada, yada. Um, so... Basically, I, I'll have a list of, of possibilities, and Mark is making fun of my gestures again, isn't he? God damn it, Mark. Um, so I'll have a list of possibilities, and then um, he, the GM can just go to the paragraph that's based on what's going on with them. Although I often feel, the, the biggest struggle I have with that, honestly, is feeling like I am just doing the same structure over and over again, where it's like, if the PC's X, if the PC's Y, if the PC's Z, and like, it's really annoying to read. So, uh... Thank you, editors, for making that less annoying. If A and B and C, that ending one, else if. Well, that's why you just do a switch statement. It's so much easier. <laughs> um, but um, 
So in that case, in that case, it would generally be if the PCs end the ritual, then this happens. If they also do this, then if they also rescue the people, then there's this other benefit. And then in a new paragraph, it would be if the PCs fail to end the ritual, then the venture captain is very disappointed in them, or possibly says something where it's like, "It's okay, you tried your best, guys." Pat, 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 pat. Because I kind of feel like the venture ca- in some ways the venture captain being like, "It's okay, ah, guys, you tried your best." Is like even more of a oh come on than actually just failing the venture captain being mad at you. So it really depends on the personality of the venture captain too. And for adventure paths, a lot of the way I've seen multiple endings pan out is by a victory point system that is measured throughout the course of the adventure path or at least the final volume. So what you do is <laughs> um that you <laughs> what I've seen typically is you accumulate points for doing various things well and then you get an ending that are generally all in the same direction but they tend to be endings that <laughs> <laughs> they tend to be endings that are sort of like is it better or not like in Jade region I remember that if you got a ton of points you get this super unrealistic um, ending where it's like, even though the like Oni have been screwing up the nation for decades and everything is terrible, this person who came from another continent can sure fix all of the problems that this country has immediately, and it's immediately a golden age and everyone is happy. And then there's the second ending where you have slightly fewer points that you're more likely to get, where it's like there are still growing pains because Binkai is recovering from Oni's and, um, the Empress is a foreigner, but it, they're doing great, and they're on the path to recovery. And then there's another one where it's like, well, a lot of nobles are really unaccepting of a foreigner as the Empress, and really the the nation was hurt too badly, so it's still in bad shape. And then there's another one where it's like, oh yeah, I'll only just kind of leave and, and um, are still around and causing huge problems, and everyone's very upset. Mm-hmm. And there are versions of those that are at the end of a lot of different adventure paths. So um, you can definitely use um, a long-term victory point mechanic in your adventures as well that just like sort of adds up points based on different decisions that PCs make and with thresholds determine what the ending is. Victory points and thresholds are, uh, are a great way to go about it, especially if you have a lot of... Um, Especially if you have a lot of different points along the way that you can track um, that overall contribute to the success. Because then it can really feel like you're building up toward things. And you can communicate to players, too, that there, that there is this system and that they're earning these points and things like that. Or telling them, like, oh, man, you just made some, pro- you just made some progress toward this thing. And um, it feels like everything that you do can matter when there's a system like That's that. That's right. Nobel Phoenix says... Do you consider the possibility of players finishing a previous adventure with a bad ending when designing new adventures? It'd be awkward if the new adventure starts in an idyllic and peaceful country when a world shaking catastrophe just happens to its neighbor at the end of the previous. So, uh, I remember uh, there's a very recent quote from James Jacobs that said that if all of the adventure paths just sort of ended all of the problems and everything was completely idyllic, then there would be no point in continuing to play that setting and you would need to switch to a new setting because the point of the setting is having interesting places to adventure conflict and interesting dynamics that are going on not just like oh it's happy peaceful fun land so i would imagine that um, a lot of adventure paths have taken an iconic ending that um the pcs succeeded but generally not much at the highest that there's not interesting adventures there anymore so i would imagine although i've never discussed that like it would be taking that second more realistic but very positive ending to jade regent rather than the first one where it's like it's a golden age and there are no problems um so uh however um the adventures obviously can't assume that like you failed all the adventure paths because in general it's assumed to be successful so you all right, so if you failed every adventure path and then you're running adventure in the same location, you need to make an adjustment. Um, also an ask Actually, I have an answer to that question as well. Oh, okay. Um, in terms of uh, adventures and new adventures building off of old adventures, that's why uh, Pathfinder Society scenarios have... Um, th- 
that's why a lot of them have reporting conditions. Um, and for those, we can we can say, okay, if the PCs save this person, checkbox A. If they fail to save this person, checkbox B. And then we'll look at. And then if we consider um, what's going to happen with that NPC in the future, we'll we'll pull that reporting data and see whether that NPC was saved or not, or whether that whether they became an ally or an enemy. That makes sense. And we'll use that. So Falso asks, do we both prefer a kind of ranking system where the endings are clearly sorted from best to worst? I'm not even saying I prefer that. I'm just saying that Adventure Paths use it a, a lot. In a, um, to, in a um, scenario when I write things out, I to, to use P, second edition terminology to make this clearer, I generally use a success, critical success, failure model in terms of the order in which I list things. Hmm. So... The success being what is the so so that way the first thing the GM reads is the most likely thing to happen, which is that they succeed, but they don't necessarily do like absolutely everything perfectly. Then it naturally leads into the extra benefits they get, and then below that is okay, so they messed up. Now what? But sometimes you have, um, I mean, to give an example of an AP that has a system where it's not a ranked choice system, and it also is something that you don't find out about until the last volume, but then the GM hopefully remembers, like, War for the Crown um, has a system by which um, the PC's decisions sort of shape um, the direction of the new administration. And there's not necessarily one that's best or worst, because all of those um, administrations are still have the same goals, but sometimes, like, if the PC's murdered everything in sight and every person on their way, the administration is like, well, we can help people by murdering the bad people. And if PCs made friends, then the administration makes friends. And so there's not one that's right or wrong. And generally, the PCs probably will like whatever is going to happen because it's working the same way that they did. So, so if there's not such a system, then I may rank them. I may do them in order from most to least likely, or I may, or, or just, or which thing came up first, which option came up first in the adventure, or even like which could be sorted alphabetically first. I mean, there, there's a lot of ways to sort it. It just depends on the situation. All right, so Ruximus is wondering, uh, what writing structure would you use to build drama and suspense in a Pathfinder 2nd Edition module? Or is there an industry template? Well, there's certainly not an overall industry template that we're like, directly looking at. But generally, generally the idea that... Um, that the challenges at the beginning of the adventure are easier and you do build up to this climactic boss challenge that is harder than anything that they've faced before, whether that is a most challenging monster who is at the heart of things, whether that's an NPC who they need to who they need to deal with or, or what have you. So I'd say that the, the only the only thing that is pretty much universal is challenges get harder as you go along and there's some kind of boss challenge. I think when Pathfinder Society has tried to paint outside that box, um, for instance, uh, No Directions Ryan um, is famous for his adventure that did that. Um, people respond and they don't like it. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, I like mixing things up, but like Ryan's adventure, the first encounter was the hardest encounter in a lot of ways for some groups. And they were like, whoa, I was taken off guard that this first encounter was so hard. That was a cool encounter. I, I liked love it. that encounter. I liked that encounter. Yeah. And I liked that it was really hard. And my diviner definitely had no problems. And was it, in fact, there was never a risk that my diviner would take even a single point of damage in that encounter. But the rest of the party might have died. Yeah. Um, that reminds me that we missed a question earlier that mm -hmm. asked, um, is there any academic study into the structure of adventures? Sort of like in the same way that they're film studies classes, um, and like, uh, and and studies that dissect literature. I think I haven't seen any that are. I uh, have not seen any either. But if anyone, adventure. if anyone happens to know of any, I would be certainly happy to take a look at that. That would be very interesting. I mean, I've definitely taken a few classes on um, with my literature concentration, a bunch on literature and a few on film studies uh, that were with literature because they're about Shakespeare films so I could attempt to do such an analysis at some point in the future but it would not be it would not be super academic <laughs> um, let's see what in, okay so a lot of people are talking about the bug and why it was just a random single pitch 
Um, all right. Um, whether our mic is a mimic, a mim mic. <laughs> Get what I want. And whether it was actually tinnitus in disguise. Okay. All right. So, so um, we made it through, and there are no more questions yet. Were there any other um, outlining tips or sort of adventure pre-writing tips that you wanted to give people, but uh, you haven't given them yet? I guess what I would say is, and I alluded to this in a few different places, but um, inspiration can come from all sorts of different places. It can come from, um, I tend to work best when, I, I, I mean, it's very hard to come up with an adventure in a vacuum where you're just saying, uh, I don't know, I'll make an adventure. So it can come from pop culture, as we talked about before. It can come from, a lot of times, since I'm writing adventures in Galarian, it'll come from looking through, um, looking through things in the bestiary, saying, oh, this is a cool monster we haven't used. Is this, uh, this monster has this interesting thing that's going on with it. Or um, we haven't had an adventure in, uh, it's like, oh, well, we've never had an adventure in um, this country before. Or we haven't had an adventure here for a while. What kind of interesting things are going on here? Or um, I think it would be, I think it's time for, or we've had a lot of urban adventures in a while. I think it's time for a wilderness adventure. Okay, where on the map are some nice wilderness locations that maybe we haven't been in a while? Oh, well, you know, this forest is interesting. Maybe we'll do something over here. What do the books say about this forest? Oh, look, there's a cool adventure hook. So I would say just keep in mind inspiration can come from a lot of different places. Makes sense. Night Trace is stoked for Gen Con. Me too. Um, let's see. So there were some other questions. False One said the False One had a question, but um, oh, was writing it. But mm -hmm. while that happened, several questions appeared. Buximus asked, what successes or failures have you had in delivering a plot twist to the PCs? So, I don't know. I've had some pretty good successes with plot twists, even when I took a really risky one. So, my riskiest plot twist was um, I had a player, and he was just generally um, one of the players that, like, I think the first edition GMG or, or some other book called, like, a lurker where... He was very quiet, and he was clearly enjoying himself, but didn't really talk up much. And I would often do things like giving him an intelligent item that always only talked in his mind, so that he had something to engage with that would bring him in. But at one point, he was making his next character, and I asked what his backstory was, and he said, Oh, I don't really know. I have amnesia. And he was like a paladin of the god of knowledge, and he had amnesia. So, I decided... I was like, okay, sure. I, I, I put that into the story. I was like, and you have this cool sword that's like made of a weird material that does extra damage against um, against certain types of creatures. And it like channels um, magical energy. And he's like, oh, that's cool. So um, what he didn't know was that I had decided that his character was the BBEG who had given himself amnesia so that he could... Um, leave himself at a temple to become a paladin because he needed a paladin with this particular sword to kill his um to kill this other person who he had convinced to run his stuff and who he would convinced that like he was in love with her he needed her to die to um complete a ritual so the party was fighting the person and um the other bbeg who they thought was the bbeg and she had disabled everyone else, but not the paladin. She just didn't even target the paladin with her attack. And it's like, why are you attacking me? We can, we can rule uh, this world together. Just work with me. So, is something wrong? And in, in he and he even was engaged during this fight. He was the only one who was still up. He was like, she's pretty dumb. I'm a paladin. It would be breaking my code if I worked with her. This is like the least persuasive villain speech ever. And then he killed her and completed the ritual and discovered that actually he was a powerful scion who had given himself amnesia. Then the personality fragment of himself from um, when he was a paladin, like, temporarily wrested control and used an altered reality to give himself his own body so that he was still around, but then the bad guy was around at that point. And that was super risky because 
you don't know how the player's gonna react to that. But he was like, that's so awesome. I want a multi-class into Psychic Warrior now because my original self was a Scion. And he was super stoked with it. Uh, but at the time, could have gone either way. Um, what was your biggest success or failure with the plot twist? You know, I really can't top that. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, also, there was a clue because he named his character Adam and Lilith was the name of the person that they were fighting. So, mm -hmm. you could figure it out if you know biblical mythology. Um, Alright. What, you can top it with a failure? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, plot twist failure. I don't really remember any major I'm plot twist failure. I'm trying to remember Maybe I've just lost them out of my mind. I, I don't know if I had any catastrophic plot twist failures. I tend to be a lot more conservative with um, plot twists that I give. Um, so... I, like, I don't think I would have dared to do that. So I, I'm not thinking off the top that of my head. That was definitely the, risk, the riskiest plot twist. Yeah. I've done a lot of other pretty big plot twists or um, surprises, but I've never done any one where, like, the player was actually the villain. Well, what about the one where... And, uh, and he didn't know. What, what about what about the one where the player where the player's intelligence sword was actually a demon lord in disguise? Oh, yeah, you did... You did do that, where yeah. the, the where the fighter had an intelligence sword that was actually a demon lord in disguise. Yeah, it was it was just this really cool magic sword that he had. That and he it wanted to be bathed in blood. It wanted to be bathed in blood and to gain more power. Yeah, it. and if he if the more he fought, the more the stronger it would get. And it was it, yeah, it pretended to be like this righteous spirit that it, of like someone who had helped him escape the world room, but it was actually a demon lord in disguise, and then the party eventually figured it out, and they destroyed the weapon. Wasn't it, like, a nascent demon yeah. lord that was... It was being controlled by a nascent demon lord that was, like, the daughter of Zora yeah. and Sokos Finaz or something. Yeah, and then and then it wasn't actually exerting any control on the PCs, but... It was, it was just, just convincing him to it was do just it. It was just convincing him to fight more things, and that if it... My, and then the thought was that if it eventually got to a certain level... Then, uh, then the demon lord could escape and become this other thing. It was close, but then the rest of our party figured it out and performed an intervention. Yep. And the fighter, actually, it was an interesting twist because the fighter afterward just got really mopey because, like, a lot of his courage came from the fact this sword who claimed to be a, a pal like a paladin's daughter who was also captured with him in the world mm -hmm. wound was, like, here coaching him and telling him to be brave yeah. just to get the sword more powered up. And so once he realized that, first of all, that was a demon, and second of all, he didn't have that anymore, his character, who was, like, this brave general, just, like, sort of became a craven coward. Yeah. And we gave him our best other sword um, that could, it was transformative, so he transformed it into his weapon, a falchion. And, 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 and that, that I was thinking is like, okay, well, he loses this, but he has this other transformative weapon. It was a really weapon, good sword. So, so he's not going to lose having a great weapon, and it's going to be And cool. then he kept, like, hiding and not going into combat because his character was a coward. So some of the rest of us are like, well, if you're not going to do that, we should give this to the Aldori Duelist to be an Aldori Dueling Sword. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we, we thought he was going to fight to kill yeah. him, so he's like, oh, I, I you're mean, right. It was like, basically, we should give it to the cohort in character. And then he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm just going to stay in the back. And then, and then the... Uh, the, the PC bard who was the king and kind of led the charge, and that was like, no, that wasn't what was supposed to happen. You were supposed <laughs> to challenge for the sword, and you were supposed to say that you should have it. Then he taught all of our armies to just run away, turtle, and hide in the streets and not fight back, um, but turned out to save them because they got attacked by pouncing, superstitious barbarian army that would have crushed the army, but all they were doing was hiding and running away and waiting for us to come and fight the army. So it worked out, but... Yeah. Um, that, 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 that was a good plot twist for yeah. you. Uh, sometimes the plot twist can be very, very, um, determined ahead of time, like those, and sometimes they can just sort of be emergent properties that happen during the game as well. Um, let's see. Question from Nitrates. How do you decide what regions adventures take place in and or are covered? In society in particular, it feels like sometimes we hit some regions more due to season metas or whatnot, but other places feel like we haven't even hit them yet. Um, yeah, so we do have a map of uh, a map of the world that we use for for that, and we do try to, if, if a, an area is tied into the season meta, of course we're going to see it more often. We do try to cut a wide swath. Um, it's actually notated season by season to see how long it's been, and we also have lists of all the locations and how long it's been since we've been there. 
Um, there are certain places that are a lot harder to set adventures in, and so those aren't going to show up as often. Um, so, for example, the fact that um, until recently uh, there was no way to go to Medjugorje Island, the headquarters of the Red Mantis, and a place where um, being a Pathfinder Society agent who steps foot there is a crime punishable by death, um, was if it's, you're not going to have as many adventures there. Or the, when, where there are more hooks, we're going to set more adventures. All right. Uh, that makes sense. Luis has a great question. We talked about the difference between planning for a linear adventure compared to a sandbox. Um, not directly, no. Um, so, so with this, most of the outlining that um, we've discussed has been Linda's outlining for Pathfinder Society Adventures, and they're never going to be a, a sandbox. A true, not never going to be a they true sandbox. They might be a yeah. little sandboxy, yeah. and then you'll get reviews that are like, "This was too sandboxy, and it took too long." Um, yeah. But um, you definitely need to outline a sandbox in different ways, and that actually you outline a little more like the ones I was talking about that aren't quite outlines, but have certain bullet points. And a little bit of like a before and after. So like usually even if you have a sandbox, you still have a structure that is narrow at the beginning and the end and then widens out in the middle. Mm -hmm. That's typical even for an adventure that's not a sandbox to widen out a little bit in the middle and be just very narrow at the beginning and end. A sandbox just blows out in the middle if it's a published adventure. Yeah. Obviously for a home campaign, you can just... They meet, so at some point it's narrow, but you could just blow out and just let the PCs do whatever you want if you want, like, a, a true sandbox. Where they can go anywhere, and then you're not, and then in that case, and in that case, what you're doing more so in that home adventure is you are out, you are outlining and planning what some of the tools in the sandbox are going to be, and then dynamically, as you see which tools the PCs like more, you can shape the structure of your adventure and focus more on things. Because you don't want to over-plan when you're in a sandbox and violate the what is, it is the zeroth rule of Dungeon Craft from the old Dungeon Craft column of just planning out a thing that you don't need at all. Um, but give yourself just enough, and then once the PCs have expressed interest, then you know you need it that's when you flush it out. And um, for sandboxes, particularly if you want to be able to get back to a certain location because, say, you're doing an adventure path, flowcharts. Seriously, flowcharts. Um, and um, little graphs and, and uh, drawings and things like that to show how different pieces connect, um, if they do connect. So if it's that once the PCs do any of these three things, then this other option opens up. The more you can, the more you can plan out and have the sort of this, this structure that shows you everything at the same time. The better off you're going to be. Um, victory points also can work very well for sandboxes because then you're not expecting that they're going to do any particular thing that's available to them, but they're going to be, they're going to do some number of things of this type in order to, in pursuance to this particular goal. So if they are, if they are trying to um, overthrow a tyrannical government. And the tyrannical government has these ten different uh, weak points that you have planned out uh, that you know are going to be there. Then you can say, you know, once they have, oh, once they have earned, and each each of them can earn some points. And then once they've earned, say, eighteen points, because each of them earns between one and five points, then they've earned enough points to cause the tyrannical government to respond. And then this other event happens that intervenes. And in this case, uh, particularly when you're running it um, as a home as a home adventure. Um, you can then go in and say, oh, they're doing this other thing that wasn't one of the ten things that I planned. But because I have the structure in place, I can say, oh, well, this is worth points, too. And right. then I can just roll with it. So false one says narratively in a story, conflicts usually escalate, but mechanically resources deplete, making you nominally weaker as you go along during a day. How do you structure a home stretch where you pack less encounters into a single day? Well, there's a few different things. Um... As long as you're not too blatant about it and it kind of fits with the story, having um, drops in some of those earlier encounters in that day that can help to compensate for resources that the PCs may not have. So, for example, if you have a party that doesn't have as many healing resources as maybe would be good for them to have for, uh, for doing such a long section, there may be some cache of healing resources that they find, or there may be some, some other things that can help support them through that. Also, I mean, it also depends upon whether or not the adventure structure mandates it being in a single day, because sometimes PCs, even if you plan for them to all to do it in one day, when they when they wear out, is there a possibility for them to retreat and come back later, or is it going to be the case that say they have to do this in this one day because they um, 
because the their opponents are going to call in reinforcements from the army the next day and there's going to be an overwhelming force at that stage so i would say um keep keeping an eye on their resources um also keeping in mind that you have flexibility in terms of how and when encounters combine um and uh, making them combine less if the PCs seem to be more tired. You can also have flexibility in the tactics that your opponents use. So, um, again, if the PCs are more worn down, um, going with less optimal tactics that still make sense for the NPC, but there's a wide range of tactics that can make sense for an NPC. So, Alex said that he did something similar to some of our twists in Strange Aeons, where one of the characters was insane and kept getting false memories instead of the real ones. Uh, that reminds me of, so I, at one point, was running a game um, for Iron GM that I adapted to a one-shot for a home group, where Linda's character had a twist where, like, her character had, like, I think six or five wisdom, no ranks in sense motive and perception. Mm -hmm. The twist was any, and, and, you know, there weren't secret rolls um, per se, but anytime she announced a result of zero or lower... I would, uh, uh, she had a really bizarre and unbelievable backstory, so I would actually give her a clue that was true about her backstory, but it just sounded like I was giving fake information, because back then, we also gave fake information for really terrible knowledge or sense motive checks that everyone knew was wrong, too, because um, they got a, nat they got a really, really low number, and then they would roll players like, no, this is true, but everyone, yeah. everyone knew it was wrong. So we already did so, that in our home group. Like, there was just, like, they, they had all been killed in battle, and we're going to Valhalla, and there's this really nasty Valkyrie, and Linda's like, why is she being so mean? Oh, sense motive negative one. It's like, it's because she's your sister, and she's mad that you um, abandoned being a Valkyrie to become a mortal, obviously. Mm -hmm. And people were cracking up. It's like, that's the stupidest thing. And then I'm like, sister, it's like, sister, why did you betray me and all this kind of stuff? And then the idea was that my, my wisdom was so bad that it, like, broke through the wards that were supposed to suppress my memories. That's right. It wrapped around into being correct again whenever she was below zero or worse. Um, so let's see. Craig and e points out the worst plot twist fails are usually the ones where people just completely miss that the twist exists or don't understand it. That's true. Yeah, that's true. I, I I'm mean, sure I've had that sure happen. There could be twists where someone's like, that's, I hate this twist. This is not what I want for my character, but we haven't had it happen yet. Um, all right, let's see. False one says biggest plot twist failure. It was all a dream. It was all a dream is just generally a bad idea. Unless you're using it was all a dream as a way to get out of a bad situation like a TPK, and you and you have no other options. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Or unless it's very much in the spirit of the game that you're running, and the players recognize that that's the thing that could happen. Like if the player if the players know that there is an a, a opponent that they have that is an that is an evil uh, that is an evil onaromancer, then you know having them be trapped in a dream at some point and then realize that actually they were in a dream and they woke up and they and they had been captured or whatever you know that that makes sense. But so Nitrix is asking, is this Paizo's trade secret IP or could we see such a thing headed into PF two? I'm not sure what he was talking about all of these plot twists are from home games that were not an ap except for the um the one with the demon lord thing you just added that to i King just Maker. made up yeah it was the map uh the map that the map uh for um where scenarios go is it is an internally maintained resource it's just like a uh it, it's basically just a map with it's, a, it's basically just a map with different colored pens writing dots that we update. So. Yep. And there's, al um, there's also the very valuable resource of, like, John's sketch map of the United States with other countries sort of on it. That oh, I, I, lo I, love the, I love the map of the United States that gets dots based on where conventions are and things yep. like that. Yeah, but if you're looking for a resource of scenarios by location, um, Pathfinder Wiki is really, really good about that. That's true. And, in fact, sometimes I use, I'll just use that instead um, because it has this whole indexing of scenarios by location and NPCs and where they go and things like that. 
Um, we have an impression version of the map of Society HQ. Um, well, the thing is that the the adventures that you see on the on screen in scenarios aren't the only adventures that happen. Um, I guarantee that there are plenty of other adventures that Pathfinders go on that we don't show on screen. There are more than twenty six um, expeditions that the entire Pathfinder Society performs every year. There's also a lot of there's also a lot of days where it's like Pathfinder is in Grand Lodge training. Pathfinder Pathfinder spends weeks looking through books, combing through books to see if they can find something important about this location. Nothing of value is found. Yeah, you probably don't want to play Pathfinder, that Pathfinder, yeah, so, so, I mean, all the stuff that Pathfinders do that isn't as interesting as off-screen, and there's also implied to be plenty of other adventures that we just don't have time to get to. Uh, so, GM Reckless is wondering if you'll snap a pic on your phone and put it in the secret leshy part of the Discord or something like that. I would say probably not. Probably not. If I if I'm gonna share something, then I would be sharing it more publicly. I'm not gonna use my position at Paizo to, you know, this isn't. Yeah, I, I want to make sure that I'm being fair. And that I'm following the rules in that regard. All right, we're seeing a lot of other interesting twists about people with their weapons. Or um, Elthro has one that was time displaced. Um, uh, with. Some serious flesh warp situations. Yeah, and Nitrous has another good point. Not everything is issued by the Grand Lodge. I don't think that there's anyone in the Pathfinder Society who would actually be able to construct such a full map of what all the Pathfinder missions are and have been. Mm. False one says Pathfinder laundry quest after swallow whole monsters. I mean, there, there's one NPC who I think would be the most likely to possibly be able to do that. Um, this NPC to, to have a map or to have to, to have do a, laundry after it's all whole monster. No, no, to have a sense of what all, what everyone does. Um, but that that NPC that NPC appears in uh, the the passing the torch series. Ah, well, there you go then. Also, um, there's one NPC who was in the very last encounter of um, the um, Eyes of the Ten. Yes. Who may be the same NPC? Who may be the same NPC? Uh, yes. Who, that NPC definitely probably could do that. The PFS sent party consisting of Indiana Jones, Dora the Explorer, and Carmen San Diego. I'm just imagining like Dora's going along and introducing everything and singing, and Indiana Jones is like trying to be all heroic. And Carmen, Carmen San Diego is like you can't find her because where in the world is she? Or maybe she's stealing things. Yeah. Where in Goleran is Carmen San Diego? Yep, although the, I guess they would have to change the San Diego to like some place that is in Goleran. Yeah. I don't immediately off the top of my head have have like the perfect um Yeah. The perfect location for that. It would probably be somewhere in Arcadia though. And yeah. Alex said just Carmen Arcadia in general. Let's, Let's ask, ask the map. Like, where are we going now? Let's ask the map. Map, what do you say? <laughs> David Nielsen says, if this is a PFS scenario, the last character is the Punisher, who just is murdering everything while the rest are trying to explore. Yeah. Well, if you want more Arcadia, have you seen that there is indeed an Arcadia adventure? Yeah, Maybe. but that came out already. He wants more Arcadia. Okay. That, that is part of Arcadia, but not part of more Arcadia. Well, there could be more Arcadia if you hadn't seen it. Oh, but we are, we already advertised it when Luis came on. It was Luis's adventure. Fair enough, fair enough. Every time something comes out for Arcadia, it stops being part of more Arcadia and starts being part of Arcadia. Until eventually, you don't need more Arcadia because everything is part of Arcadia. Mm -hmm. Alright, well, it is part five of an adventure pass, so I would imagine that it would give lots of spoilers if you just read it just to learn about Arcadia. That's true. False one is wondering, can you do wield Arcadia? So, I mean, in Skies of Arcadia, you probably can. <laughs> but, um, you might not be able to dual wield literally Arcadia. Although, if you did, you would want to probably use the Plane of Arcadia from Dungeons & Dragons in your on hand, because it's a little heavier and the continent of Arcadia from uh, Pathfinder in your offhand, because it's a lighter weapon. 
I bet Ravagug could dual wield Arcadia if Ravagug got out, just split the continent in half and use the two halves to get out Yeah, but could people. he actually get the Dungeon and Dragons plane? I don't know, he's I feel Ravagug. like he would be destroyed by a power even more powerful than himself at that point. What? Intellectual property lawyers. No! <laughs> Alright. Nitrous is wondering when the Society versus Razmir. Well, um, I would say, to some extent, the very earliest Pathfinder modules for Pathfinder First Edition were a little bit Society versus Razmir because in Mask of the Living God, you do talk to like some of the local society people in your Mazet before you go and screw around with Razmir's cult. So we do have some Society versus Razmir from the very beginning. False one says, I hope we kill off Razmir, one of his right hand men, adopt his name and image, and carries on the gig. I mean, if you're famous for wearing a mask, then you, that could, probably could happen. Makes me think of, like, cults of Norgerber and how often, it, they, if you have, like, a leader of a cult of Norgerber, one of the secrecy cults, how often the person at the head is actually the same person, or if it's just constantly changing around and people are killing each other and no one knows. Probably the real leader is all along, not the one who is the ostensible leader, so that that person can keep being assassinated and the real leader can provide some measure of continuity. Yeah. Razmir is like Lassie, different actor every few seasons. <laughs> I don't know, I think that the actor um, is always Jason Bowman. Yeah. There will never be a Razmir who's not really Jason. Or the Dread Pirate Roberts. Or Jason and the Dread Pirate Roberts. I mean, Jason's, uh... But the Dread Pirate Roberts is on his boat just pointing forward and moving through the moving through the desert for no reason. I mean, Jason's, uh, Jason's avatar art that he uses for his stream is like that piratey one, right? Yeah, it's, the, from his, the... it's from his pirate loot um, card game yeah. that, that he put out. So he totally is the Dread Pirate Roberts. And he's also Razmir. Yep. So there you go. Infallible logic. All We've right. just proved it. This feels like squirrels on top of squirrels at this point. I'm going to squirrel. I mean, it is sort of based on plot twists and some of the other things we were talking about. We could probably do a whole episode on plot twists. Um, does anyone have anything else about outlining and pre-writing for adventures? Oh, look, it's a um, Pride Wing Razmir with a magic wand. That is clearly... That would be an interesting version of Razmir. Mm -hmm. This makes me think of Razmir as... With, with the wings, with the wicked mask, this makes me think of Razmir as, like, what's that creature that's like a flying mask? Spirit Oni? Spirit Oni, yes. It's like Ra Razmir, Razmir, like the Spirit Oni. I just wanted to experience the pleasures of the material world. And that is a system neutral magic wand. That doesn't really look like magic wands in either system. Honestly, it just looks more like a Clearly, kind of it's wand. a second edition wand because you wouldn't go to all the trouble of putting a star at the top of a wand that's just going to burn itself out after 50 charges. I like what that do, answer. What do you think? Um, uh, Mark, did you know Pathfinder First Edition Alchemist can use wands? False one asked. I did. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Pathfinder First Edition, um, investigators can't use wands? Because that was one of the few questions where, um, I was pretty confident about that they could. And then I literally asked Steven, who wrote the investigators, like, no, they can't. Uh, because it, it technically didn't have the same language and it was slightly off. I was like, this is just one of those cases where the language is different, right? He's like, no. I intentionally changed the language so it would seem that you couldn't use wands because I wanted them not to use wands where alchemists use wands. So mm -hmm. that, that was something I learned um, after working at Paizo. I mean, sure, they can use magic devices, um, David, but I think False One was talking about just alchemists can flat out use wands in first edition. All right. So yeah, that's something that um, I was doing wrong with my my um, investigator in Pathfinder Society, and now I know that he does not use wands automatically. Mm -hmm. All right, that is definitely a squirrel, but um, hey, you know what? 
we have an AMA tagline here, so we will generally answer questions. So Rucksmith has a good one. What are the top three pieces of advice you would give others or yourself for new module writers? Okay, so I would say um, stick to it. I would say follow the outline and the instructions that you've been given. Okay. It, so that's step related one. to outlines. Um, yeah. But yeah, so don't, already, yeah. So don't go rogue. Yeah, don't go, don't go rogue. Uh, don't so, go like, rogue. If you have an adventure that's yeah. about like, I, I like political intrigue in Taldor, don't give one about moose hunting in um, the Crown of the World. Or even, or even just make sure that you make sure that you write to fit whatever specifications have been asked of you. But also, um, also look for way, also look for ways to um, to use you know your own creativity and bring your own spin to things. Um, as long as you don't go rogue. As long as you don't go rogue, yeah. There's sp there's spaces in between, and make sure and filling those in with sort of your own style and your own story, drawing upon your experience as a player and a GM of what you find to be fun and interesting, um, as well as um, and you you can like I said you can talk to whoever outlined you and assigned you the scenario to try to flex things. Um, so I would say that in making adventures. Uh, not it's not just thinking about what you and other play it, you would think is interesting. It's also thinking about what other players and GMs you've interacted with would find is interesting because making adventures that uh, adventures shine the most when they can allow um, players with a variety of styles to find something that they enjoy. So mix between so making sure that yes, there's definitely going to be combat, but there's also going to be chances to use skills. There's going to be chances for characters with a variety of builds and players of variety of interests to find something that they're good at, to find a place to shine, and to find something to interest them. So your top three tips are don't go too off outline. Mm -hmm. Don't go too just in the lines. Yeah. That's two tips be in between those two. And then third, make sure there's variety. Yeah. What if the outline is really monotonous and it looks like the outline has almost no variety? Should you email your developer and be like, it seems like this encounter is zombies, and then the same zombies, and then the same zombies again with a necromancer, and those are the only three encounters in this adventure. Is there a way we could have more variety? Or do you think that that is something that is maybe a little bit too much going rogue? Obviously, you're not just changing it on your yeah, own. Yeah, I would, no, it's, it's definitely, that's definitely not going too much rogue. I would say, though, that when you are saying that there's an aspect of the adventure that you don't, or the outline or whatever that you don't like, um, be respectful of the person you're working with. Don't be like, this stuff sucks, so I'm going to fix it. Uh, what it, kind of a dumpster fire of a developer wrote this outline, yeah. which I know is you. Be respectful and professional, but also, you know, but also recognizing that, you know, you could have ideas that can make the adventure better. The developer is not like this all-knowing person. Uh, so uh, when, you, when you have something that you think you would like to change, it's always best to have a few suggestions of what you would like to change it to. Right. Because Rather than if, just say, this is bad. Because if you just say, this is bad, well, the developer has already given their first stab at this thing. And so they will have to, then that puts the work back on them to try to figure out what you mean by this is bad. Um, but if you have a few different suggestions, then you're, then what you're doing is not just offering criticism, you're opening a conversation. Right. Plus, I mean, at this point, you were hired as a freelancer to come up with ideas, not a critic to say that ideas were bad if it offered no recommendation on what to do. So if you have a better idea, the developer might take it. Or they might say, no, the reason that all these encounters are zombies is very important for mm -hmm. the adventure and for another meta point later on where adventure captains realize, wait, all of those encounters were zombies, even though we usually have mixed encounters. And, that's a very, and then they discover... That secretly a zombie lord was doing something. Yeah, but in that case, uh, in that case, if I were to receive something like that, and it was supposed to be about, well, encounter variety is always good. Not just, uh, not just having a mix of combat encounters and encounters that are, and, and non-combat encounters and situations, but also, uh, also different types of monsters with different strengths and weaknesses and combat styles. Uh, this is something I didn't mention before. So if I could combine my, uh, so. So if I could, this is sort of a build off of that third point slash maybe another point, but uh, making sure that it's not all undead or all humanoids. All humanoids is the really hard one when you have urban adventures. There's such a thing where you get into it and it, it's at all possible to say, okay, here's one with an animal. 
or here's one with an outsider or whatever. I mean, all, hu- really all humanoids can work because can work, humanoids, but... humanoids of different classes can give you a very different feel from fighting them, whereas all zombies is... Like, yes. even all undead, in theory, can be a very varied encounter, although certain options won't work. Yeah, we try to really we try well. to avoid that. Um, this is going to be less of an issue in 2nd edition where there are fewer immunities, but trying to make sure that PCs of certain builds aren't going to get locked out. But that, um, but that desire to make sure that it's not, say, all humanoid is why you might sometimes notice that um, in adventures that people have very unusual allies. Like, okay... So they're working with a spirit Nagi now, and in part that comes from let's keep let's shake things up. These three street ruffians also have a Jabberwock who's a part of their gang. <laughs> okay, that's that's probably not a good idea if they're still being described as street ruffians and not like master spies or assassins, then they probably shouldn't have a Jabberwock friend. It was a Jabberwock that was um, not the one for Golarian, but it was actually from another planet, because there's one for each planet, that was mm-hmm. called the wrong side of the street. And it came over and joined this gang of street ruffians. <laughs> Why? <laughs> hey, you know what? There was literally a Pathfinder Society adventure where in one sub tier, the, uh, like, the Aspis Consortium's couriers were bringing the, the tame Jub-Jub bird to Magnabar to show up in a zoo. Like, usually it's like a wild boar, but mm-hmm. if you're playing the right sub tier, it's the tame Jub Jub bird. Incidentally, this is part <laughs> of the reason why we don't do scenarios that are, that are like, that broad. I in feel like that is, that is like having street ruffians yes. attack you, and then in one sub tier, then Jabberwock is part of their group. Like, he is a little higher level than Jub Jub bird, but. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, not everything we've done in past adventures is necessarily something that I would advise to do. Um, so, how specific vague, Ruxmas asks, how specific vague are the outlines and how much latitude you're given? How much is this collaborative effort or mostly your idea? That depends on the individual outline, honestly. So, we discussed it at the very beginning as well. Mm-hmm. Um, depending on where your outline is coming from, Pathfinder Society versus Adventure Path versus Module, or I guess they're adventures now. Um, and even who's writing the outline, mm-hmm. and even what outline they're writing, um, you can get a widely different, um, widely different outline. And Linda even talked about how sometimes if she's giving it to a really experienced author, she leaves it more open, and then that sometimes comes back to bite when something that's not a mistake but just collides into another scenario yeah. comes back. But in general, in that case, I, I'm th- I'm thinking that. Yeah, there's a much higher chance that even if even if I have a few details that need to get changed uh, because of collisions with other products or what have you, that the benefit of that outweighs the. False one summarizes the mix up in of urban encounters to make sure it's like the chase scene in Life of Brian. So there you go. You might want to do that, or you might not. Mm-hmm. Okay. So does anyone else have any more questions about outlining adventures? And generally, otherwise, pre-writing um, before the beginning of your adventure. Looks like we've made it through to the end. 